Wake Forest has traditionally been an afterthought when it comes to the names and legacies of FBS programs. They have the worst all-time winning record among Power 5 teams and are regularly among the lowest funded of those teams. The Winston-Salem-based university is home to a distinguished academic tradition, but an athletic program that has never stacked up to those colleges around them, like Duke, Virginia Tech, or even App State. They're not the type to stand out on paper, especially for football, but Dave Clawson and his entire staff and team have decided to embrace that. Last season, as a lot of y'all know, they went 11-3, only their second 10-plus win season in their history, and the road to this point hasn't been smooth, straight, or in any way traditional, but it has been by all means successful. My name is Kevin Redfield from The Dropout Sports, and let's get right into it. Wait, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up. Before we get right into it, I just gotta ask y'all to like this video and subscribe to the Dropout Sports YouTube channel. Alright, now let's get back into it. Like I said in the intro, when Dave Clawson was hired to be the next Wake Forest head coach, he inherited a team that had just had their fifth straight losing season, and most of their starters from that season either left, graduated, or got drafted. He had to resort to starting mostly underclassmen for his first two years, including throwing true freshman quarterback, John Wolford, right into the shot caller position. Without much of a team to plan around, Clawson and company went 3-9 in both 2014 and 2015 with a still capable defense and a still raw offense. It wasn't until 2016 when the Demon Deacons found their footing. That year they went 7-6, which might not seem like much on its own. But just like every achievement, it's all about the context. At 7-6, Wake Forest had their first winning season in 8 years, and was the first time they averaged more than 20 points per game in 5 years. That year the defense especially stepped up, with big time names like Markel Lee, Duke Ejiofor, and top NFL safety today, Jesse Bates, coming into their own. To cap off the year, they won the 2016 Military Bowl against Temple 34-26 their first bowl win since 2008. That offseason, Dave Clawson received a well-deserved contract extension through 2024, and from then on, the Deeks had a winning identity that was completely their own. Remember when I said for 2016 that it was their first time scoring over 20 points per game in five years? Well, that was just a prelude to the monster of a season that is 2017. In 2017, they broke the team total yards and points scored record behind senior John Wolford's 39 total touchdowns to only 6 interceptions. They also beat Texas A&M in the Belk Bowl 55-52 in a game that would become legendary for Wolford, running back Matt Colburn, and all the Demon Deacons on the team. For the next three seasons, the Deacons would sustain their offensive capabilities and their winning style. A quarterback battle between QB1's own Sam Hartman and Jamie Newman would encapsulate the up and down nature of the program before Hartman was given the reins to the offense in 2020 and Newman transferred out. That very 2020 season was the first losing season for Wake Forest in a while, but in a way, it acted as the groundwork for a 2021 that no Wake Forest fan could ever forget. Despite star running back and 2021 Heisman candidate Kenneth Walker III transferring to Michigan State, Clawson found gems in 2020 that were rearing to contribute to the team in the next season. Jakari Roberson had made a splash as possibly the best receiver in the ACC, Harmon had his first full season under his belt, and some wicked young talent was starting to grow in the secondary with first years Nick Anderson and Kalen Carson cementing themselves as staples of the Deacons defense. We just saw a Wake Forest team go 11-3. I'm going to go through some highlights of the season in a bit, but I just want to reiterate again that Wake Forest is the smallest school in the ACC, and they get the least funding out of any of those schools. And yet they went 11-3, 7-2 in conference, and won their fourth bowl game in six years. They started by winning eight games in a row, and the highest they were ever ranked was ninth. 
Yeah, see, the success of the Demon Deacons was never truly appreciated on a national level, even when they were undefeated, and y'all know how much fans and media alike love that term. In that 8 game winning streak, they were beating their opponents by an average of just under 20 points per game. One of the highlight games of the season came in week 8 when the Deeks beat Army 70 to 56. That is the most points Wake Forest has ever scored in a game and it's the highest scoring game they've ever been a part of. At week 10, Wake Forest was ranked 9th in the first college football poll and 10th in the AP poll, the highest they've ever been ranked in either poll. After a high scoring loss the next week against in-state rival North Carolina, they bounced back to beat 21st ranked NC State 45-42. At the end of the year when they beat last minute bowl replacement Rutgers, Wake Forest was ranked 15th in the final poll, the highest any Wake Forest team has ever been ranked in that final poll. Alright, so you are an 8-0 Wake Forest team that is only ranked 9th with two one-loss teams ahead of you. An undefeated Michigan State is ranked multiple spots ahead of you with a very similar schedule excluding Michigan. Even before the big Michigan win, Michigan State was ranked above you with some close wins to a two-loss Indiana and a three-loss Nebraska team. How does all that make you feel? Angry? Discouraged? Confused? Well, I can offer some reasons on why you rate that low, but I don't think you're going to like them. With Clemson falling off the pedestal they'd built for a decade, the ACC started to lose the appeal that it had in previous years. There started to be a cluster of new coming competitors like North Carolina State, Pitt, and of course Wake Forest. This made ranking a team like the Deacons less attractive to a poll voter than a quote unquote proven team like Oregon, Michigan State, or even Cincinnati. It also didn't help that Wake is not and has never been loud when it comes to recruiting. I'll get more into it later, but for a lot of people in college football, a player's ranking when they're getting recruited tends to stay with them during their playing days. And with colleges that recruit higher classes like Penn State and Clemson, they're generally agreed to be better programs than an under the radar program like Wake Forest. We see this happen season after season with group of five teams that aren't able to recruit those five star players. Of course, Luke Fickle and Cincinnati have been able to break that barrier, but it was only after winning 11 plus games for three of the past four seasons and going 9-1 in 2020. Just like in NCAA Football 14, you can upgrade the coaching ability and championship contender rating all you want. But at the end of the day, there are those things like program tradition that you just can't change. Just like a lot of things when it comes to Wake Forest football, the recruiting classes of the past, present, and what's looking like the future won't stand out to anyone. But for Clawson and the Deacons, they work well within the restrictions they have. Because they aren't able to compete with the Alabamas and the Ohio States of the world for those five-star prospects, they instead go to the underrated three-star guys that have room to grow and become those four or five-star players by the end of their tenure. We've seen those undervalued guys like Jesse Bates, Chikari Roberson, and John Wolford take a year or three to learn the game and get themselves a future in football. In his eight years of recruiting for Wake Forest, Dave Clawson has never gotten over 10th in the ACC in class recruiting rankings, and he's only signed three four-star prospects. I didn't come up with this, but I've just got to say it anyway. He's essentially playing money ball with how he's recruiting and how he grooms players. Clawson's not looking at the glitz of a Travis Hunter or a Caleb Williams. He's willing to take in raw talent and buy his time as they grow into contributing members of his team. And that ability to track and develop talent has pushed Wake Forest to have the third best record in the ACC since 2017. This kind of recruiting also makes it so that predicting Wake Forest success in 2022 is harder than it would be for any other team. The Demon Deacons could have any number of guys step up that hadn't previously broken out. The fact that Sam Hartman, A.T. Perry, and a good number of the defense are returning should give Clawson and Wake Forest a level of relief. But you never truly know if that one random breakout guy will or won't develop between now and September. I mean, I think the Deacons are going to be just fine considering how they've made an offensive scoring machine and have gotten some defensive help in the form of former Purdue D coordinator Brad Lambert, but I just wanted to put it out there that 
uh, you never know and there's always going to be that air of mystery. As the college football landscape has changed over the past decade, teams have played their guys younger and recruited as high as they can. But against what the FBS zeitgeist has become, Dave Clawson and the Wake Forest Demon Deacons have found their success by going against the grain. Instead of keeping up with the Joneses, they've built and played in a way that embraces their small college roots. They can't build big, so they look through the fog of the media and see the diamonds in the rough. Sure, it took a little while for them to be a true competitor in the ACC, but in the long game, those with the most stamina are the ultimate winners. Thank y'all for watching. Just a bunch of dropouts. <laughs>